What you want more than anything is you want to meet people with different experiences. And I've always sort of found you would see things that you would not automatically have come across. Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast, the podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. I'm Scott Chaloner, and in each episode, I'm joined by a director, a CEO, a CFO, a government minister, a chairman, a president, and who knows, maybe one day, even the president of the United States of America. That's if the proposed immigration ban means I'm allowed to make the trip across the Atlantic, that is. The aim here is to discover who these people are, the people who get up every morning and make the country work. We discuss everything from technological innovation to keeping connected in a lockdown nation, and of course, the success that makes the endeavour entirely worthwhile in the end. We also get their take on the current economic and political landscape here in the UK. I'm delighted to be joined on today's programme by Adam Nosworthy, Managing Director of Fusion Telecom Limited. Founded in 1999, Fusion was earmarked as one of three in over 600 telecom businesses that were forecast significant growth due to its investment in innovative contact centre applications. Fusion is the company behind the award-winning communications platform Innovation that provides small to medium-sized contact centres with access to leading technology, allowing them to finally enjoy personalised and efficient customer interactions. But you don't want to be hearing the finer details of that from me, so we'll leave it to the man himself. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present Adam Nosworthy. Adam, welcome. It's great to have you on the air with us today, and thank you very much for joining us. No problem, Scott. It's an absolute pleasure having you. Now, Adam, um, you're, of course, um, a telecoms um, com- company based over in St. Albans with around 25 employees under you. Tell me, with everything going on with the COVID-19 pandemic at the moment, how has it been for you trying to navigate the last few weeks? Because I can imagine that's been a real challenge. Yeah, the challenge for us has been really focused around helping our, our customers. Um, we're fortunate in the sense that we've um, spent a lot of 2018 and 19 adopting homeworking policies and using the, the existing technology frameworks out there to enable us to work from, from anywhere. Um, so from, from an internal perspective, we've been quite lucky that we completed that work before this outbreak. We found that uh, a lot of our customers, on the other hand, have really struggled, especially ones that are in vertical markets facing uh, the consumers in, in areas like uh, travel. And we've been working really hard over the, uh, the, the March and April of this year to um, help them put things in place to manage their businesses. Mm. And um, it's often said that these are very much unprecedented times. Um, Have you ever indeed had to take similarly challenging decisions and grapple with issues like this in your career before now? No, I haven't uh, found that I've been confronted with these specific um, issues we're having to deal with at this time. There have been uh, some, some some trials definitely in the past. I used to run a, a travel company and uh, we had the, the volcanic ash cloud uh, coming out of Iceland and, mm. and uh, air traffic controllers strikes around in different places. The Egyptian revolution as well happening and uh, and we had customers in Dahab and Sharm el-Sheikh. So there's, there's definitely been interesting times in the past. Uh, this, this is very unique. Um, and it's affecting uh, not just the sector, but, but all sectors, either directly or indirectly. And the scale of that's quite uh, quite humbling. And that's causing us to have to take measures that uh, are specific to this. Absolutely. And uh, we've seen, of course, um, a real proliferation of people working remotely during this time out of necessity. And some say that this could actually become a new norm for many businesses, even when we reach the other side of this pandemic. And um, is that something that you could potentially see happening? Yes, I, I can. I think um, we're recognising two key things. One is we can work remotely and still be productive. Um, we can trust staff and um, uh, to get things done, to communicate well, um, and to pro- provide and perform a, a really high level uh, of quality of, of work. We're also realising how important human interaction is and what we're, what we're missing. And the longer this goes on, I can really feel that as well. So I, I think we will um, definitely move more towards home working. I think a lot of companies have already been looking to do that, but where mm. a number of other companies have said that that's just not possible within their culture or their organization, now they've been forced into it and can see that it's not only possible, but in some ways it's actually beneficial. 
um, we'll, we'll definitely see that, that it is here to stay. Um, although I think that the face-to-face meetings uh, in the future will be far more productive as people really understand the value and the benefit of them having been prohibited from doing so for so long. Mm. And if we do stay on this um, issue, um, Adam, I understand that you did recently put some literature together about uh, protecting people who are working from home as well, because uh, some companies, of course, as you say, have explored remote working for quite some time already. But the pandemic has forced many firms to actually commence home working very quickly. And what that has done is expose some vulnerabilities as well as, of course, um, have some positives. And this is particularly relevant around companies that have to take real time assisted payments, isn't it? Um, is there a a bit more that you could to tell me about that for the benefit of the listeners. Yeah, sure. Um, so when we're, we're making payments over the phone, it's important that the customer's card data is secured. And that's important uh, for the customer um, and, and for reducing fraud. It's also important for the employee of that business that's taking the payments, that they're not exposed to card information. And um, there is a, an organization called the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council, and they've uh, placed a standard, it's called the Data Security Standard, that um, all people, all merchants who take payments are required to comply with. And that is something that's difficult to comply with at the best of times when all of your staff are working from an office. Mm. But when all of your staff are working remotely from home, that makes it extremely difficult to, to comply with because um, everybody's home phone system becomes into, into scope, their local network at home and their router comes into scope. And, uh, and of course, the, it's very difficult to know uh, exactly what's happening with people's sensitive card information when um, people at home are, are listening to that and, and potentially recording it. It's very difficult to keep any tabs on, on that. The companies are are finding as they move to home working that there are these gaps and vulnerabilities opening up um, that they need to address with more ferocity than perhaps they've addressed in the past. Mm, for certain. And um, the risks for businesses um, are huge, aren't they? Because um, I think a VisionSoft study actually showed that one data breach could cost a business up to around about 20% of its customer base, couldn't it? Uh, that's right. And and small businesses are um, disproportionately affected by this, which is actually surprising for a lot of small businesses. Um, and uh, well, what we found is that actually just over 60% of businesses with less than 250 employees have to close their doors within six months of a breach. Um, and that's partly because of the audit fines as well as um, and the audit costs as well as the audit fines. Um, we, we also find that there are a lot of breaches that are, that are going on that we're simply not aware of because a lot of these things are me- mechanised these mm. days. So there's actually 633 attempts, according to UK government figures, to breach a business every day last year. So that means that these things are attempting to happen. Small home networks are less, uh, are less secure than certainly corporate offices are. And that uh, should people find that they suffer from a breach and companies suffer from their breach, there are, there are many different problems that they have, not, not just the fines, but also reputational damage. Absolutely. And um, it's important for these businesses as well to uh, make their staff um, aware of these um, issues, um, isn't it? Because um, one study has showed that human negligence alone accounts for around about a quarter of all breaches, doesn't it? That's right. And um, as well as the, the human negligence factor, you've also got um, the problem that um, there's an increasing uh, amount of uh, contact centre and um, uh, agents that are being targeted uh, to either be coerced or incentivized to provide card information. So as a business, you do need to consider that if you're exposing your staff to sensitive data of any type, uh, that that does leave them vulnerable and uh, you have a duty to protect them. And of course, the knock-on effect as well is that um, companies um, who do suffer breaches um, are also falling foul of the Data Protection Act, and that encompasses GDPR as well. Yes, that's right. And I think something that um, a lot of uh, companies might have missed with it, the GDPR is that the GDPR was incorporated into UK law through the Data Protection Act. And the Data Protection Act in itself uh, covers uh, goes a little bit further, and that puts company directors uh, as being personally liable for neglecting to comply with the DPA, the Data Protection Act. So um, that that means that they're personally liable for up to half a million pounds. So it's really important that um, company directors realise 
that they do have a personal liability in this and that um, protecting their customers' data as well as their employees' data is, is, is really, really critical. Mm. And when it comes to potentially resolving some of these uh, vulnerabilities, could perhaps using technology offer a solution, especially with regard to open banking payments? Yeah, and that, that's where we're really lucky. I mean, a lot of these um, rules around data security have come in over the past two years. And, uh, and, and a lot of the, the technology changes have also come in in the last couple of years. So you've got new technologies that actually help Companies take card payments just using their telephone keypads for consumers typing in that card information rather than reading it out over the phone. And that's a really big win for businesses as it helps secure their staff as well as their customers' data. So that technology has only really been available to uh, to sort of smaller companies in the UK who account actually for 76% of all companies in the UK um, for the, in the last 18 months. So that's really exciting. And then um, on top of that, we have something that's potentially set to change the game for payments and how consumers make payments and businesses receive them. And that comes from the Payment Services Directive. Mm. Um, On the 14th of September 2019, um, the uh, European Union put into effect the the Payment Services Directive. And that allows a technology that uh, promotes bank transfer between consumers and customers with the same difficulty that currently exists in making uh, a card payment. So it's just as easy to do both, but yet it slashes the cost for companies in terms of taking the payments. But it most importantly above that, it, it really reduces fraud rates and actually eliminates chargebacks. So that's a really good way the businesses can also engage to secure their customers' data and protect their staff. And we are seeing some businesses as well already moving to online payments only as well, which removes the risks of real-time assisted payments from their day-to-day operations as well, which help only helps protect their employees, customers, directors, businesses. But also as well, it's um, important to essentially remove um, opportunities for cyber criminals as well. Yeah, that's right. I mean, businesses will always look for um, a quick and easy way to take payments, um, especially in businesses that require um, a, a frictionless checkout system. Um, when I used to run a travel company, I know that when we had a customer on the phone um, or via web chat or, or via email that said, yes, I'd like to move forward, we needed to work fast to process that customer's order. And the longer that you take and the harder that journey is, the more likely you are to lose that sale. The so businesses will always be looking or organizations looking to, to, to process that in a simple way and in a fast way. There are mm. technologies now that allow that to happen over any communication channel and um, it, in a secure way too that really does protect customers. So that w- whilst there are these challenges for companies, the technology really does exist and it is cost effective enough for businesses to actually implement it. So it's more a question of making it happen rather than whether it's possible to happen. I think you're absolutely right there. And I think it's also important, the point that you touched on, of making that online journey as easy as possible for the consumer as well, because if authentication for customers is a little bit too overbearing, it can essentially up the abandon rate for sales, can't it? And that's going to be a little bit of a problem for businesses and just something that they need to be aware of going forward. That's right. And I think that's why um, open banking and payment initiation services that we touched on are actually quite important because the payment services directive also encompasses strong customer authentication. It's being called uh, SCA. And um, that's coming into effect now. So that's requiring anybody making an online transaction to uh, be authenticated with knowledge, something you know, possession something you have, like a token or a mobile phone, and something inherent. So that could be a biometric element like a fingerprint. But two out of those three following methods need to be used um, when you're making an online transaction according to strong customer authentication. And that came into effect on the 14th of September and will be rolled out this year. Um, and that's going to, we're going to see an increase in friction for online checkout for card payments. And that's going to impact UK businesses just at a time when they're really struggling um, at, at, at this moment with the coronavirus. So in order to help businesses 
make more sales and try to reduce that friction. Not only do they need to adopt strong customer authentication and really engage with that process to minimize the impact, but they do also need to look at alternative methods of receiving payments, such as open banking. And I think that's plenty of food for thought for businesses, especially um, at this time, Adam. Um, if we now sort of shift focus and look retrospectively at um, the Parliamentary Review article that um, Fusion wrote for those that haven't read it, you discussed something about um, contact centres not only employing 4% of the nation's workforce here in the UK, but also the ever-increasing role that they have in keeping the country running as well, especially now. With a renewed focus on working from home throughout COVID-19 so far, do you envision at the importance of those contact centres being something that just keeps on growing? Yeah, I think contact centres are, are, are really important and they're not what they, they used to be. So, if we, you know, starting off with call centres 20 years ago, a lot of people crammed into a small space, disempowered, trying to answer lots of calls, re- 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 um, saying the same things over and over again. That's really changed. And that's really changed because we're valuing much more the, the, the agents that are working within these contact centers. There's a lot of competition now because so many people, one and a half million of, of, of working people in the UK are inside contact centers. And because of that, we're really working with technology to help empower each individual contact center agent to be able to, to deliver the best, have a real varied work stream. And Technology also allows contact centers to work from home. And as we engage less and less with businesses face-to-face, certainly we've seen the decline of, of that within the high street. And we're seeing the high street you know, turning into a place that we socialize more rather than go and shop for, for, for essentials. We're finding that so much more business is done online, but we still want to speak to people. We still want to chat to people via web chat or via email. Mm. And, uh, and, and those people need to be somewhere. And um, as we start to find that through this pandemic, people can work from home, there's a significant cost reduction opportunity for businesses where previously they're paying uh, for, for large premises in which they can house um, lots of these contact centre agents. Contact centre agents are finding that they're reduced costs, not having to travel to work. They can, uh, they're more, often in a more comfortable environment if they have a home office. Um, and yet they can work just effectively using this technology. So these workers are critical for the UK economy and actually underpin a lot of the sales and customer service functions of pretty much all online businesses. Absolutely right. And um you discussed, of course, in that review article as well, one of the applications that Fusion created, which worked on two fronts. Um, I understand that it doesn't just help contact centres retain their agents by sort of enhancing and diversifying their experiences, but it also makes the experience better for the consumer as well. Could you perhaps elaborate a little bit more about how it does that for the listener's benefit? Sure. There's lots of technologies that um, have started to develop and really be deployed within the past year and a half. Two of the key ones, the voice of the customer and voice of the agent. It's really important for businesses without having that direct contact face-to-face to really understand how uh, we as consumers have uh, have enjoyed our, our interaction with that company. So asking us some questions around that is important so they can really gauge it if they're doing things right. Customer experience is really the key driver for contact centers these days. In the past, we've been... Uh, contact centers were seen as a cost for a business and therefore businesses tried to reduce that cost. And often that led to a very poor customer experience. We can remember those days in the past. Now, actually, contact centers, you'll find, you know, if we reset the, the, the expectation in our head, we find that they're, they're really positive places to, to, to engage with. We, we get good answers to questions. We get people really trying to help us, people with the access to information to be able to help us. They're much more secure. Um, but we do need to continue to find out how consumers feel about this and how we can continue to improve. And the same with the agents. We need to ask the agents who are, are providing all of these services, how are they finding their experience? And the better we can make their experience, the better access to technology that they have, the less repetitive their job is, the happier the agent will be and the more the agent will be able to help uh, the customer when they call up. So technology that can help find out how agents are feeling about each interaction and how customers are feeling about each interaction and then 
bringing that and putting it together in, in really simple ways to display to leaders and managers within this area so they can make informed decisions quickly. That's really important, and that's technology that, that uh, we, we help a lot of complex entities these days. And it sounds like um, there's a great deal of uh, merit in that as well. And um, even more interestingly for your innovation technology that you also talk about at length in the um, the article, um, I did notice that you mentioned it didn't need to overall any existing um, infrastructure either. Um, it can essentially sort of go over the top of existing technologies in a certain way and still be compatible without um, the inconvenience of a complete overhaul, as it were. Yeah, I think this is another really exciting development within technology that um, before it was a sort of rip and replace type style of, of walking in and, and packing up all the boxes and, and putting in loads of new ones and, and a real project, a, a lot of capital expenditure for businesses as well. And that's just not the case anymore with the way that technology is designed and the way it's come forward only in the last few years, you can deploy a significant amount of technology really quickly, really easily into contact centers. And the training requirements are significantly reduced too, as the user experience is, is so much better. I think a really good example of this is online banking. And I remember the days when if I wanted some software on my computer, I would go into a shop and I would buy the CD and the manual, and then I'd have a process of installing it. And after installing it two or three times, because there were usually errors, I then had to read the manual on, on how to use that software. And nowadays, we're just not expected to do that as a consumer. So if you want to, to use online banking, for example, you don't have to install anything. And you certainly wouldn't expect to have to read a manual to, to learn how to use that application. So we're finding that the, the deployment of technology is so much simpler, both on a technical and an, and an, an operator level these days. That uh, means that companies can, can really, they're really empowered to secure data, improve the, the operation for their, their staff and, and improve the operation for the customer very quickly. And we're certainly seeing that it's um, helping businesses run so much more um, effectively as well. And it's also enhancing the experiences for both consumers and agents alike. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's really, um, it's really kind of heartening to see technology really helping um, everyone and that's and that's it's, it's um something i always really look for is a win-win and everyone is smiling around the table after changes have been made and that's something that technology is really helping in the uk economy right now with contact centers and the improvement of contact center technology and therefore the improvement in services that uk businesses can offer to uk consumers and therefore at the end how uk consumers feel about doing business these days they, they are happier because it is easier Absolutely. And technology is so, so important um, at the moment, as we've already touched on, for maintaining contact, especially for business leaders with regard to their employees as well, with everybody working remotely, as we've already touched on. That's right. Working remotely has really introduced, um, uh, I think, more of a worry in a lot of business people's minds about the ability to do that, the, case, the capacity to do that. But the underlying technology absolutely exists to make that um, something that is it can be really embraced and can be a real positive effect on a company's bottom line. Their, their cost base, it can be a real positive effect on an agent's uh, sense of, 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 of work and, and access to information and uh, comfort working from, from their own home. There's lots of real benefits that can be achieved. And this, this force to do that um, over the past few weeks and few months I think we'll, we'll um, show UK businesses there's so much to be gained uh, from working from home. Mm. But also with the um, proliferation of people working from home through applications such as Zoom to maintain contact, that also throws up its own security risks as well that have to be managed in a similar way to companies who take payments have to manage those risks as we've discussed already. That's right. There, there are clearly some um, problems that are surrounded. Um, there are clearly some problems surrounding home working. And um, one of them is data security, and that needs to be addressed. And that can be addressed with technology these days. Companies that are taking payments from home can take payments in many different ways in a secure fashion, but they must deploy the technology that, that makes that possible for them. Otherwise, they really do leave themselves at risk. 
And there are other issues as well, which is that human contact. One of the things we do at Fusion is every single day at 12 o'clock, it's not mandatory, uh, it's optional, um, employees all join in to a, a single conference and um, we spend 20 minutes playing, having fun and chatting. And there's a lot of online games that some of my younger staff have uh, a lot of access to and, and load up for us. And we have really good fun for, for just 20 minutes from 12 o'clock, 20 past 12. And that really brings us together in a way that we lose from not meeting each other at the coffee machine. But it, it does um, leave us together with a feeling that we're all here, we're all working, we're all in it together, even though we don't see each other all the time. So there, there are things we can do and, and ways we can use technology to mitigate uh, and in many cases resolve um, the issues that working from home brings. You made some very interesting uh, points there, uh, Madam, because um, this podcast, uh, first and foremost, is um, all about leadership as well and really bringing that into uh, focus. And I get the impression that um, your own leadership style, from what you've told me, is very much people orientated and maintaining that sense of unity, especially around about this time. Yeah, I found when I first started uh, as a leader in business in my early 20s, I was much more authoritarian. Um, I decided to build structures that people could really work within. And that kind of command and control style I find I found over the years has, has been for me for me the wrong approach. And certainly over the last ten years and especially the last five, I've worked really hard to help each and every person be empowered um, with the role that they're doing and to find within themselves a sense of purpose and ownership over everything that they do. So a good example of that is rather than training someone and then providing them with some tasks to do, and then after they've proven they can do those tasks well, giving them the responsibility, we flip it the other way around. So we give them the responsibility first. And that then typically um, puts the employee in a state where they, they go, oh, my goodness, what, what am I going to do now? I, I'm responsible for this, but I'm not quite sure what to do. And so they start asking questions. Well, how, how do I do this? And how do I do that? And what happens if? And those questions, because they're coming from them, when we provide the answers, which is effectively the training, um, it is adopted and understood and internalized in a way that providing the training prior to that in the way we used to do it simply didn't do. So that ownership from the, the employee to walk forward um, based on what it is they're seeking to know, we found it is so, so much stronger. And it means that when we're home working like we are today, that the staff are really finding the best way for them to do what they need to do to meet the requirements that they set themselves. So it's a much more relaxed leadership style for myself because I can trust my team so much more. That's really interesting because um, you say it's um, a relaxed uh, leadership style by deploying that um, sort of training strategy, as it were. Um, would you say, therefore, that sort of taking a back seat and making sort of employees go out of their comfort zone in a way is um, a critical part of their development and making them sort of push the boundaries a little bit, as it were? Yes. Yes, that's right. I think um, it's really important to create a gap. And I was so keen to take care of my staff in the past that I didn't allow a gap to exist between where they were and where, where I was. So I was always making sure that they felt supported. But actually, I think that can be a little bit overbearing. And by allowing that gap to exist, you can see which staff are ready at which time to move into that gap and with ideas of their own to resolve things. So there's a lot, there's a lot more steering um, from, or shepherding, if you like, I think, today in my leadership style. And I find that I actually enjoy that more. I'm far more relaxed myself. Um, the team definitely enjoy it more. Their motivation is a lot higher when they've got the sense of ownership over what they're doing, and they've got the space with which they can explore in front of them and use their initiative and creativity to solve issues. And quite interestingly, Adam, you've mentioned there um, in your career that you started out with a very different leadership style to the one that you essentially use these days. Um, do you think um, with that in mind that great leaders learn to become great leaders as opposed to being born with certain innate qualities, as some people might believe? 
I tend to see the world as a mixture of everything. So I would say that um, I, I've certainly learned a tremendous amount over the, the past 20 years. And I've, I've learned by, by making a lot of mistakes and learned so much from that. And um, I think some, some people are, are more apt um, at uh, different things than others. And some people have a great aptitude for leadership and others have to work harder at it. Um, I, uh, I've definitely learned a lot over the, the past few years, and that must mean I've got so much more to, to learn. <laughs> um, but I do enjoy the process so much more now. Mm. It's quite interesting that you mentioned there that you have uh, made mistakes and learned from them throughout um, your career, Adam, because there are some people out there who may be afraid of taking certain risks, trying new things and making mistakes due to a fear of failure and a fear of criticism. Whereas really embracing that and being willing to learn from it is an important step in one's development, isn't it? Yes, it is. I've, I've had, I can really sympathize with that. And I've had um, times in my life where I've been more nervous and um, at, about making mistakes or admitting to mistakes. And, and that really does prevent the ability to learn from them. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard emotional challenge to, to lead because you're faced with emotional difficulties that you don't typically have to process. Making decisions, for example, as many companies are now, uh, about whether they uh, make someone redundant or whether they ask the team to reduce their salaries to stop making somebody redundant. And and there's a really, really difficult decision, especially when you know and care about people that are involved. Um, so th- there is there is a, a space within which you need to sit back, I think, and, and I certainly do, and just reflect and bring myself back to a centre space. Um, think about the learning and, um, and, and try to work work with both what we know but also what we believe uh, and and trusting ourselves in that process is really important and i only think you can really develop that trust with yourself if you are open to the fact that you will make mistakes and you're willing to reach out and ask other people for help I can certainly see where you're coming from there, Adam, because I think um, as a leader, it's very important to remember to surround yourself with people who are a little bit more experienced than you, are going to uh, help sort of um, get the best out of you, but also you can do the same vice versa as well. Um, We've talked an awful lot as well about your leadership model uh, today, but what would you say are the influences behind that leadership style? The greatest influence I've had around my leadership style, certainly in the past two years, has been from looking at my children's education. Um, They go to a Steiner Waldorf school, and I've been looking at the way that they're taught within the classroom, and that has significantly impacted how I react to myself, my staff, and and how I run the company these days. Um, That's been one of the biggest influences, which is all about coming from within and the experience of the world through that person's eyes. So I'll look at the experience of the world through my employee's eyes and what is really important for them and how do they understand what it is that they're doing. And therefore, I frame what I try to to give them or to work with them on on the basis of what's important to them rather than what it is necessarily that the company needs or what the key performance indicators are driving. Hmm. In the past, I would say that a lot of the influences that I've had had have come from mistakes that I've made and uh, the the people that I've had are fortunate enough to to work with. And if you could actually speak to yourself, say, 10, 15 years ago, uh, Madam, would you give any advice to the younger you or tell the younger you to maybe do something a bit differently? Yeah, I was really inspired when I was younger believing that anybody could really do anything and therefore, I developed a system to allow uh, people to grow based on them completing certain tasks. But because the tasks involved a, a, a real holistic, um, a holistic set of skills, they typically did the ones they were good at very quickly. And so initially, it was a real success. And then they faltered or struggled with the things that didn't come to them easily. And then it petered, it petered out at that point and became quite, quite difficult and sluggish and they lost motivation and lost interest. I think I would go back to myself at that earlier stage and say, 
seek what people are really excited about. Seek what it is that they're interested in that moment and engage with that first and foremost and allow the other things uh, to develop. I would be less controlling, uh, more open, and um, work in a more collaborative way with what I had at that time. I think that's very sound advice, Adam. And I think if anybody is about to start their first day and embark on their own leadership uh, journey in um, their own leadership role, um, I think they do very well heeding that advice as well. Um, if we do look at the future, um, Adam, before we do wrap things up on the today's programme, do tell me what you think the next 12 months hold for yourself and for Fusion Telecom and what you really hope to achieve in that time, particularly in navigating COVID-19 and then coming out of the other side of the pandemic. Fusion Telecom is in a very fortunate position. Um, we're well uh, prepared to, to weather this COVID storm. My greatest concern is, is for our customers and how we can really help them over the next 12 months. I think having a fluid uh, approach to, on a month-by-month basis to the challenges that might come is going to be important. And I think being specific and prescriptive to each challenge as they come is also important. Um, we can't uh, try to paint all of our customers with a single brush or expect that every solution is going to work for them all. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really being open on a case-by-case basis to each problem that comes, each customer that comes forward with a requirement and addressing that in a very specific way. I have to say, Adam, um, it's been an absolute pleasure and also incredibly insightful having you on the uh, the programme today to discuss these issues. And what I actually think would be fantastic for the listeners is perhaps in a few months' time to have you back on the programme to look at what we've discussed retrospectively and just see how Fusion Telecom is doing and how things have played out. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to speak with me today and share your views with us. No problem, Scott. It's been a real pleasure to, to speak with you and be on the programme and um, I really look forward to chatting with you and the listeners at any point in the future. I look forward to it as well, Adam. And I think, um, as I say, it would be absolutely fantastic to look at this um, again and revisit these issues and just see how things are going post-pandemic once we start to see the, uh, the mist lifting, as it were. No problem. Thanks for your time, Scott. Thank you so much for your time, Adam. I hope you all enjoyed my interview with Adam and of course learning more about how the whole team at Fusion Telecom is continuing to raise standards even throughout this challenging time. Coming up next on the programme, I'll be handing over to Matthew O'Neill for his exclusive interview with Lord David Blunkett. Lord Blunkett is an active member of the House of Lords, a former Labour MP and Secretary of State and of course the Chairman of the Leaders Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Despite being blind from birth, Lord Blunkett is one of the most prominent politicians of his generation, having held a number of senior positions in Tony Blair's cabinet and having served as the MP for Sheffield, Brightside and Hillsborough for 28 years. Lord Blunkett was first elevated to the House of Lords in August 2015, anointed Baron Blunkett of Brightside and Hillsborough. I hope you enjoy listening just as much as Matthew enjoyed speaking with Lord Blunkett, and that's coming up next. Lord Blunkett, welcome. Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you. Um, Well, of course, uh, nothing is being said uh, at the moment other than COVID-19, which uh, we must touch on. Um, What would your message be to small businesses who are trying to keep going? Well, I think the last ones standing will be the ones that thrive when we get back to some sort of normality. So it's have confidence and courage Obviously, take advantage as far as you can of the government help. I think that Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has gone about as far as you could have expected Mm -hmm. in the circumstances. There are obviously small businesses that fall between the cracks. Those who uh, don't have um, defined premises, can't benefit from the business rate waiver, uh, have not really been able to demonstrate that they can uh, adhere to the PAYE for furloughing staff and, of course, whether they can receive the the grant, 10,000 or 25,000, all all of those who can uh, are obviously able at least to benefit from that for the time being and look to the future. But I think the second thing to say, and they don't need me to tell them this as a politician who, who did once do a business studies qualification, which is 
that it will be a different world and being able mm. to think about how that world will look in a year's time and be creative about it and learn from not just what's happening to you at this moment in time, but to others around you and the sector that you're working in, that will be really important. Do you feel that the long-term uh, effects of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, will in some ways be positive uh, for a British industry? Well, only in the sense that people are having to be creative, they're having to adjust and innovate. Therefore, they're thinking about more productive, if you like, greater productivity ways of delivering the same service or delivering the same products. And in that sense, I think we'll have temporarily at least very much higher unemployment than we've become used to, but we'll probably have a burst of productivity, mm -hmm. which will help with the recovery, whether it will help with the inequity of the way in which our economy is imbalanced, both between services and product productivity and, and uh, production of goods and services, I'm not sure. What we will need to try and do is to ensure that the geographic imbalance that exists is, as far as humanly possible, is dealt with by both uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation from the bottom up and targeted government help, which will still be needed. And we are now in the throes of the kind of borrowing that we saw back in 2008 to save the banking and economic system. We're, we're having to do that to save the whole of our productive business and mm -hmm. commerce. And I think that will have to be sustained for some time. Do you feel that people will take a second look at global supply chains in the wake of this outbreak? I think there's going to be much more creative ways of using local supply and linking up inside sectors much more effectively. And I hope that the Leaders' Council will be able to play a part in that in the sense that people who mm. have something in common, a synergy in terms of what they're delivering, whether it's a service or whether it's manufacturing or whatever, uh, will be able to see that there's a, a, a good outcome from n knowing the sector better, linking with people, not just geographically locally, but those in this country who may not have been on the radar in terms of what they produced for the supply chain. And, of course, um, ensuring, because there's quite a lot of fraud going on as we speak with um, people getting into cyber attacks, that they'll also take account of going into the, the cyber security side effectively as well. The more we are online, the more people who are working from home, the more vulnerable those businesses and their supply chain become. And that's something to think about as well. How important is strong leadership at the moment? Well, I actually think that it's brought to the fore leadership in a whole range of areas from Obviously, government itself, and there's been ups and downs with the Prime Minister's uh, severe illness, but all the way through the public and private sector, people have, to use the jargon, stepped up. And they've shown uh, local, regional, national level the kind of leadership that Britain historically was very good at. Regrettably, we've not seen, seen the same on the international scene for mm. all kinds of reasons, uh, but maybe we will in future. So I think out of this will come experience of people who have seen an opportunity to do good as well as seen an opportunity to provide a good uh, a service or goods, uh, including, for instance, shortages uh, for the health and social care uh, system, um, the food chain and the like, uh, but also I think in terms of seeing the, the synergy between the private and the voluntary sector and using people's uh, commitment to each other in a very positive way. I, I'm not sentimental about this. Things will revert, mm -hmm. but actually I think there is a, a kind of moment of moral judgment of people feeling that they've got a role to play outside the immediate survival that they're engaged in. And if we can hang on to a little bit of that social responsibility, that will be a very positive outcome. Absolutely. Now, what's your broad view of how the government is responding to this? Are you broadly supportive of their measures? 
Well, it may surprise people to hear that, that I have been very supportive. Of course, there's been legitimate criticisms about the speed of response on protective equipment and on issues relating to testing. But my own view is very similar to the challenge that was made to the Prime Minister of Italy when people said, why didn't you close Italy down faster? And he said a fortnight before we did it, I would have been considered to be a madman and nobody would have agreed to do it mm. if I'd tried to move too quickly. And I, I think that's something that we need to reflect on here in the UK. We, we may have seen the signals elsewhere uh, across the world and taken them more seriously at the time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. But as someone who's uh, had his life in uh, the opposite uh, political party to the, the present government, I think that with some hiccups and mistakes, they've not done a bad job in what has been incredibly difficult circumstances. And you're absolutely right. In a, in a liberal uh, democracy that we live in, it's, it's very difficult for people to swallow orders given to them from government. Um, well, the, the UK and, um, and the US, and to some extent to the Scandinavian countries, have a very different interest, uh, history and, and therefore interest in maintaining the freedom to decide and the persuasion and mm. consent that's required. Uh, those countries that have experienced one way or another totalitarianism over the last century have a slightly different way of coming at this. Mm. I don't want to exaggerate it, but I think that that's why getting the balance right of getting people to go along with what you want them to do in their interests as well as the nation as a whole is a sensible proportional balance. And I think we now need to adjust to the coming out of the crisis gradually, uh, readjusting to recovery uh, in the same way. Now, something you've mentioned recently on this balance is uh, the police overreach and the enforcement of the COVID-19 uh, structures that have been put in place. What have they done right, and where have they gone too far? Well, I think that they were interpreting what was not necessarily as clear right. advice as it might have been for all kinds of reasons, because people were feeling their way. I think what's come out of it has been uh, a demonstration by local police services in some parts of the country that they could get people to do what was needed without the heavy hand of drones overhead mm. or people being told that they you know, shouldn't be walking in the street because this was all about self-isolation, not incarceration. It was about getting people not to pass the infection on to each other and therefore to provide distance rather than to make our lives a misery. Those police services that adopted that policing by consent and chipping people along did really well. Those who went over the top, I think, soon got a very substantial pushback. And one of the strengths of our democracy is that you could have that debate. People could say, I'm terribly sorry, we, we think the police force in our area has gone over the top. And that in itself is a constraint and uh, a readjustment. That, that's another strength of um, living in a country where you can have opinions and express them without actually being thought to be a fool. Now, of course, uh, the government has faced criticism uh, that they were slow to react, uh, and Boris Johnson wasn't present at the early COVID-19 COBRA meetings. Now, uh, Number 10 has claimed that this is normal practice. Uh, the health secretary often chairs COBRA meetings uh, related to health. Uh, does this tally with your experience as a secretary of state, or would you have expected the PM uh, to be more hands-on during the initial stages? I think different prime ministers do have a very different style. And Boris's style, which I think will now be considerably adjusted, was very swashbuckling. In some senses, delegating is a good thing, uh, as every leader of every business or public service knows. Those who try to pull too much into themselves end up with a massive bottleneck, uh, great uh, failure of trust and the inability of people to show what they're worth and to, to demonstrate their capability. So I, I, I'd be very wary of jumping in and saying he was wrong to delegate the essential COBRA meetings. What I was surprised about was that he didn't um, 
chair the first couple because Mm -hmm. my experience with Tony Blair for the eight years I was in cabinet was that Tony was a great delegator, but he would get a grip to begin with, watch what the difficulties were, and then give people direction and confidence to be able to get on with it. So looking back, I think Boris himself probably thinks, God, I wish I'd spotted the signals from elsewhere in the world more rapidly, and I'd just been there. However, this also raises another issue. All of us in positions of leadership need good teams around us. Mm -hmm. I think after this is over, he will be assessing those who really did step up and those who demonstrated their inadequacy. I think we'll probably end up in a year's time with a much stronger cabinet than we have today. Well, absolutely. And of course, uh, we've seen a a significant uh, drop in the visibility of uh, certain special advisors like Dominic Cummings uh, during this uh, entire period. So it'd be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, Well, it's certainly readjusted the role of those behind the scenes with those who should be taking the decisions, having received advice. Obviously, there's been a complete transformation in the profile of experts, if I might use that term, who'd previously been denigrated, Mm -hmm. scientists, medics, people with behavioral science uh, understanding. My only criticism was, were we getting wide enough advice? Were we narrowing it too much to a couple of key centers in London? But that's because I've always been adverse to everything being London-centric. I think there's great expertise, wisdom, experience out in the sticks and uh, we should use it. Uh, rightly so. Um, now, was part, pandemic planning part of your time as a minister, particularly perhaps uh, when you were Home Secretary? Well, it was, but it was on the back of risk arising out of counter-terrorism measures. Right. Uh, I was the Home Secretary for three months when the attack took place in September 2001 on the World Trade Center and beyond. We did an enormous amount of uh, scenario planning, both desktop and and real. On the back of that, it was very heavily orientated to future developing terrorism risk. I certainly got involved with talking about pandemics. I remember being at a seminar in Edinburgh where the university had done a lot of work itself on the issue of pandemics. And of course, we, we saw SARS and other things emerging. I, I think it would, people have criticized the government for not picking up the report from 2015, five years ago. I think that what happens is human nature kicks in. You deal with what you're immediately faced with. Mm. You, you, can, you can sponsor reports. This is true of business planning, of course, as well, and scenario planning for what business continuity will look like, recovery plans for business, what will happen if um, there's a cyber attack, what happens if there's an energy shutdown, these kind of things you you can look at. But you're immediately turning your eyes to what's in front of you. And had we picked up a bit more on the danger from Ebola and SARS and what have you in the past, then we might have said, what if something hits us in the developed nations? that we don't have a vaccine for, Mm -hmm. that we can't immediately whisk up uh, protective materials or equipment or, for that matter, medicines that help with recovery, all of which we now see are a danger. I think this will make an enormous difference to the planning for for the years ahead. I hope it will be widened so that we don't just look at what's happened, because very rarely do you see something exactly repeat itself Some of the circumstances will be, but others won't. So that's why I've put emphasis in what I talk about on looking at the other virus, the cyber attack uh, scenario, Mm -hmm. which could be just as dangerous in a a world of just-in-time provision. One of the miracles of uh, the modern developed world, except for the very poor, has been the distribution of food. A lot of it on computerized, uh, technologically advanced systems, if that were to come down, we'd be in real trouble. So I think we need to think those sort of scenarios as well. 
So have a full plan across uh, both sectors, uh, biological warfare, pandemics, and uh, cyber warfare. Yes, and to do so on different levels, I think again, thinking of thinking global but acting local, we mm. need a lot more to think about what would happen if something took shape that actually broke down those national and global chains and how we would cope. And without, uh, obviously, we've got enough fear and anxiety to last a lifetime without uh, creating even more anxiety. We can think about those things for the future in a more rational way, I think. Now, aside from the physical uh, threat of the virus, one of the things that people are vastly worried about is the effect on uh, the economy, not just national economy, but also the world economy. Um, now, it, it has been said by certain parties, um, and uh, I'd like to garner your uh, thoughts on this. Is there a danger of the effects of the lockdown being even worse than those of the virus? Were it be to prolonged, I fear that that balance would tip the other way. It is about proportionality. It is about balance. It's the wisdom of Solomon, really, to, to get the moment right when you start to move and then to move quickly. There's no doubt whatsoever that we are stocking up, not just on the economic and employment front, which will be devastating enough, but on the health and social well-being front, enormous challenges. And they will need careful handling because there's a lot of people whose lives, for a variety of reasons, are at risk in the future on a scale that we've been dealing with over the, the immediate handling of the pandemic, concentrating really hard on those affected by COVID-19, those sadly who have died or been seriously incapacitated, that will roll over into the economic, the social, the mental health and cultural well-being of the nation. And that will need all of us to pull together as well. Absolutely. Now, do you believe the government's doing enough for business? I think that the speed of reaction once the scale of the pandemic was clear was very good. I've praised Ricky Sunak for his action. Uh, remember, a chancellor who had only just come into office was planning to deliver the budget in the middle of March and has had three, at least three equivalent budgets since. I think he's handled it very well, understandably worried now about what we're doing to our economy. The level of borrowing is sustainable because of low interest rates, but it reaches a point, of course, where it tips over so that you can't then do the kind of structural investment requirements that the government were laying out before and in the March budget. And those will have their consequences as well as a planned payback over many years. I think we've learned something over the last few months. We, we needed to take immediate action. We don't want another round of austerity equivalent from 2010 through to 2019. I don't think the nation, on the back of what's happened and the challenges we have, could take that. And therefore, we need a different plan, economic plan, over a much longer period, just as we did from the Second World War all the way through to 2002, when the final American loans were paid off. Now, of course, uh, one thing that's on everyone's lips, um, how much longer do you believe uh, that the lockdown can go on for? I believe that we need to be substantially back in action as an economy in June. This obviously is led in terms of places where people would meet in large numbers, having to uh, adjust to the fact that it will be longer for them. And sadly, that will involve business closures. It's why the Chancellor extended the furlough scheme to the end of June. Mm -hmm. But unless we, we get things moving in June, I think we'll run into the summer where all kinds of services and industries will have 
a chain reaction effect. And what happens with one will then have a major impact on another. And then you get the skittle effect where things get knocked down that you hadn't perceived were going to be affected. So I very much, if I were in government, and I always think of things in that context, what would I do if I were in government? I would be on the side from the second week in May, on the side of the hawks in terms of saying we've got to start moving and we've got to do so with the collaboration and cooperation of the public who have got the message, who did behave, who responded magnificently. Let's try and get back. Perhaps, you know, doing things differently for a time, but substantially getting back to business as usual. Unless we do that, then those areas that can't and wouldn't expect to be back in action immediately get pushed further into the middle of the year and the autumn, and then they become unsustainable. Now, of course, um, one of the other major developments we've had recently are the changes in the uh, the Labour Party. So if we could just uh, speak on the Labour Party for uh, a while. Um, this might sound like uh, an obvious question, but uh, how does uh, Secure uh, differ from Mr Corbyn? Well, I'm biased because I believe the Labour Party um, has come out of four and a half years of a black hole of a nightmare mm. uh, where it neither represented a, a, a credible opposition nor a, an electable government and the combination was to let those who supported the Labour Party and needed some of its policies uh, let them down very badly. Sir Keir Starmer both is a highly intelligent uh, professional lawyer who as Director of Public Prosecutions led the service well uh, have to take difficult decisions at a time of austerity, understands the world beyond Labour members, but has been able to do business with those who originally supported Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. and was able to command support from them. His creation of a balanced shadow ministerial team has been very encouraging. Um, I supported Lisa Nandy, who he's made Shadow Foreign Secretary, because I thought she understood the north of England and um, the, uh, the disaffected uh, Labour, former Labour voters. But I believe that Sakir has taken on board those who have something really sensible to offer. And I believe he will be both a, a great leader of the opposition more importantly, will then present himself as a credible alternative prime minister. And all governments need an alternative government at their shoulder. Mm. Uh, it was true of us from 97, and it took the Conservatives some time to recover and to get to that position, but they did, and the Labour Party will, and that's crucial for our democracy. All of us need to understand and appreciate that a living, breathing functioning democracy requires uh, a credible, confident, and uh, in many ways uh, supportable opposition, as well as a government that we clearly want to do well, because none of us want, as we didn't with the COVID crisis, none of us want the government to fail. We want to see our economy recover. We want our social well-being to be taken into account. We want to overcome deep-seated inequality and poverty, and we want to do it with enterprise and entrepreneurship and business playing their role, and that is about leadership nationally, locally, in the private and the public sector, people with ideas, with confidence, with the ability to pull teams around them, above all, to have some idea of what it is they want to achieve and a very good idea as to how to achieve it. Now, of course, one of the biggest problems Secure is facing will be tackling the party's anti-Semitism problem. Uh, there has been a recent internal report that has been quite damning. Uh, what's your response uh, to that report, and what does Secure need to do in response? Well, there are two reports. One, which is being produced by the Quality and Human Rights Commission, uh, which he will, and has already indicated, will implement in full. The second was a leaked report put together by the supporters of Jeremy Corbyn, 800 pages of private uh, interchanges on social media 
which he has uh, Keir Starmer set up an investigation to identify uh, who did it, who leaked it, what the content was, does it have any salience and lessons for us, and where necessary action will be taken. So I hope that uh, as he moved very quickly to reassure the Jewish community, so he will be able to take the necessary steps to back up that reassurance with the kind of actions that says that this was a blight on a historic great political party that all of us, all of us were ashamed of. We've been able to put that behind us and to move on to facing the future with confidence. What's the one king, uh, key thing that Sakir needs to do to restore Labour as an election-winning party? I think Sakir Starmer's major challenge is to convince sceptical voters that Labour has not only reverted to a party that they can support because they can see it acting, developing, presenting as a credible alternative government, mm -hmm. but also that the lessons have been learned from the fiasco from 2015 onwards. In other words, there have to be very clear signals of substantial change, not just the right words, not just reassurance that we're not uh, going back to some of the crazier uh, policies, but actually that we've understood why the electorate rejected those policies so substantially in December 2019. If people get that message, they'll understand that the Labour Party has changed, as it did in the 1980s and early 90s, to become the electable government with the greatest majority in historic majority, even greater than 1945, which I was privileged to be able to take advantage of in 1997 when I joined the cabinet. Now, I know what your answer is going to be to this question, but uh, indulge me. Um, do you think Sakir has what it takes to be PM? Yes, I do. I think he has the background, he has the experience, he has the professionalism, he has the forensic uh, mindset, and he has the confidence to have put a team around him which will ensure that it will work. And those elements are true of all leaders. Ideas, the ability to build a team, to have confidence in that team, uh, and to be able to demonstrate leadership in practice, sometimes at the most difficult times. And, you know, for the Leaders' Council, those sharing their thoughts with uh, um, the kind of thing that we're doing now uh, with uh, a podcast, but also joining us in linking up in that network of people who can support and help each other and learn mm -hmm. from each other, that is what needs to be done in politics as it needs to be done in business. Thank well, you very much indeed, Matthew. Well, really thank you for coming on the, uh, the program. It's been a, an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much, and good luck to all those listening in what has been a nightmare scenario. Good luck for the future. Have courage have confidence, and yes, listen to those who know more about business than I ever will. Thank you, Lord Blunkett. Thank you. As always, it has been a pleasure listening to and learning from our guests. I and Matthew O'Neill hope you all enjoyed listening. Until next time, since sadly all of the pubs are still closed, Matthew and I will be sitting in the front room with a bottle of Merlot and raising a glass to raising standards. Hopefully we can reoccupy our usual corner in the Westminster Arms soon. Remember, look after yourselves, stay at home, save lives. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. You can find every episode on iTunes, YouTube and Spotify. The views expressed by each guest in the podcast are their own. They do not represent the opinions of the Parliamentary Review, Westminster Publications, Lord Pickles, Lord Blunkett, David Curry, or any other guest on the podcast. If you'd like to know more about the Parliamentary Review, please visit www.theparliamentaryreview.co.uk.